Good evening. Thanks for joining us. I'm Eric Anderson in for Dwayne Brown tonight. Missouri Governor Jay Nixon is increasing the National Guard presence in and around Ferguson, Missouri tonight. It's a response to violent protests that began yesterday. We're deploying hundreds of additional guardsmen to Ferguson who will be stationed throughout the community to protect homes and businesses. With these additional citizen soldiers, law enforcement officers will be better able to focus on protecting lives and property in the community. Protesters filled Ferguson streets last night in response to the grand jury decision to not indict police officer Darren Wilson. He shot to death unarmed black teenager Michael Brown. Some protesters looted stores and smashed windows. At least a dozen businesses were burned. 61 people were arrested. The attorney for Michael Brown's family says they will pursue federal charges against Wilson. That grand jury decision to not indict Wilson sparked protests around the nation last night and today. One of those protests is starting up now at the San Diego Federal Building. KPBS reporter Matt Bowler joins us by phone. First, Matt, tell us what's happening there now. Well, so far, about five protesters have started to trickle in. Um, they've got signs. The protest is officially scheduled to start at 530 um, and they've got signs uh, saying things like black people matter and they're here to protest against vent their anger over the grand jury decision not to prosecute Officer Wilson. They they also will be there also will be another protest in City Heights, just next to the City Heights Library at six. And I met up with uh, Catherine Kathy Mendonica, one of the organizers of that protest, and she says she's expecting the she's she expected the ruling. And she says that police in San Diego are like the police in Ferguson. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't, I wasn't surprised. Um, but that's what we want to, we want to mobilize the community because I, there's been so many incidents, especially here in San Diego. I mean, we're, we are in solidarity of Ferguson. But and, and what are the protesters there saying, Matt? Well, they claim there are parallels between Ferguson and San Diego. I met up with Xavier McGregor. He's one of the organizers of this protest here at the federal building. And he says San Diego's minority community, like Ferguson, has an adversarial relationship with the police. Countless times this police department has tried to uh, change its image um, with you know, uh, half-hearted attempts to reach out to the community to offer police hotlines, which the community has used, which the community has gone out and spoken and had their voices heard. Um, but again, uh, the, the issue isn't being addressed. And how are the police responding to this? Well, here at the federal building, I don't see any police. Um, like I said, there's about now there's about 10 protesters on a corner. And there's absolutely no police presence. I'm sure there's some federal security around somewhere, but they're definitely not within my eye shot. Matt Bowler, KPBS reporter. Thanks very much, Matt. San Diego Police Chief Shelley Zimmerman released a prepared statement today. She said, quote, the San Diego Police Department completely supports our public's right to peacefully assemble and express their views. Our role will be to ensure that everyone's First Amendment right to express themselves is respected in a safe and peaceful manner. The police chief went on to say that together we can set the national model for community trust and cooperation between all communities and our police department. After 36 years in prison, Michael Hanlon became a free man Monday afternoon. That makes him the longest wrongfully incarcerated prisoner in California's history. Peggy Pico talks with Hanline's attorneys about the release and how his case may affect others. At age 68, Michael Hanline limped out of prison using a cane as a free man. His conviction for the murder of a man in 1978 was overturned based on DNA evidence. Hanline and his wife of more than 30 years maintained his innocence since he was arrested at age 32. His attorney, Alex Simpson, associate director of the California Innocence Project at California Western School of Law, joins us with details and how this case could impact others believed to be wrongfully imprisoned. Welcome back, Alex. Thank you for having me. Now, how's Michael uh, Hanline doing uh, since he's been released, not, you know, about 24 hours ago? 
Well, you know, I had an opportunity to talk to him this morning. I think he's still uh, in shock, truthfully. Uh, you know, the transition from being in prison and think you're going to think you're going to die in prison to a couple of weeks later spending time with your family uh, is quite a jarring experience. So uh, I think he's taking it one step at a time. Has he shared with you any plans for his uh, his new freedom here? Uh, his wife actually has a list of things that he needs to do around the house. Um, he said that it's going to take him a couple of years to get through it. Um, but uh, the main thing that he wants to do is actually just uh, go fishing. You know, he wants to just go out in the open uh, sea with no uh, walls that are surrounding him. It's something he's really looking forward to. Well, even though his conviction was overturned, he's actually wearing a GPS monitor. How come he has to do that? Right, so the conviction has been reversed, uh, and he is uh, an innocent person at this point. Uh, the district attorney is still conducting an investigation into the case, and it's our hope that they're going to dismiss the charges in a very uh, short fashion. Uh, but until they do completely dismiss the charges, uh, he has some restrictions to make sure that he still uh, shows up for his court appearances. Now, the California Innocence Project began working with Hanline uh, 20 years after he had been incarcerated. What convinced you to take on his case and that he was innocent? You know, Mike's case almost immediately jumped out at us as a, a case where we might have a case of wrongful conviction. It was just a situation where the prosecution's theory just didn't really make sense. Um, and the more we started looking into it, the more we investigated, the more people we talked to, the more we realized that this person was innocent uh, and he was behind bars for something he didn't do. Well, upon his release, he actually thanked everybody who was involved in his exoneration. But he made this plea for the remaining so-called California 12 prisoners. Let's listen. There are many more people in prison in my situation, particularly the other 11 innocent men and women of the California 12. I asked the governor to look at their cases and grant them clemency. Now, you have also asked for Governor Brown to grant these remaining 11 prisoners uh, to have their convictions overturned as well. Um, will this case actually improve uh, their chances of, of maybe gaining that clemency? It's, it's our, our hope that that happens. Governor Brown, we're trying to get these uh, now 11 people, uh, not necessarily to reverse their convictions, but just release them from prison. Um, and the, you know, the goal is to convince Governor Brown that we have truly innocent people who are behind bars uh, for crimes they didn't commit. And obviously now that Michael Hanline's case has been uh, overturned, I think hopefully that will give him an idea that we really are talking about truly innocent people in the California 12. Now, to put this into context, Jimmy Carter was president when Hanlon was arrested back in 1978. He called himself a dinosaur. He said he was overwhelmed at the idea of jumping back into this uh, futuristic society for him at this point. Um, are, are there support programs or extra help for people who have been uh, in prison for a long time wrongfully? It's a great question, and the short answer is that not really. Um, you know, if you're convicted of a crime, you actually did it, then you and you get paroled. You actually do have programs that are available to you, transitional living, that sort of thing. If you're wrongfully convicted and you get your conviction reversed, you're just kind of sent out into the world and kind of good luck. Um, Mike is very, very lucky that Sandy, his wife, has stood by him this entire time. Uh, and so, you know, he will be, I'm sure, relying upon her for the next couple of months to ease that transition. Well, back in October, Governor Brown uh, vetoed a bill that was intended to prevent wrongful convictions because it would have allowed a judge to tell jurors about uh, evidence that might support the defendant uh, that isn't being released, which I believe is something that also happened in this particular case. Why do you think there's so much opposition to these kinds of laws in California? You know, this is not necessarily something that's California-specific. I think there's a lot of pushback when we talk about wrongful convictions. We never want to have a situation where we are, have no confidence in the system. And I think whenever you kind of have a case like Michael Hanline's, um, there's a question as to whether or not, it's not just Michael Hanline's case, maybe all of the cases have some problems with them. And obviously people don't want to accept uh, that there are, you know, issues with the criminal justice system um, that would cause people to be really concerned about it. Uh, people who have been wrongfully imprisoned in the past typically get a large monetary settlement uh, from the state's mistake, basically, uh, sort of paying them for that mistake. Will you be working to uh, get a settlement for Michael? 
you know, I think it's very premature to consider that sort of thing right now. You know, I mean, he is not even 24 hours out of uh, out of custody. Uh, so I think uh, that's something that we could be looking at in the future. Um, I think he's definitely entitled to whatever kind of compensation he uh, should get. Um, but at this point, we're just trying to make sure that he knows how to use a cell phone or get on uh, a computer right now. But, but typically the state uh, gives $100 a day for each day that they were wrongfully incarcerated, correct? Yeah, that's California has a statute so that you'd be entitled to $100 a day for every day of wrongful co conviction. So it's $1.3 million. Uh, so it's not uh, chump change for this. All right, Attorney Alex Simpson, thank you so much. Thank you. A student at San Isidro High School is recovering from meningococcal disease. County Health Department uh, says the agency has notified people who may have been exposed. It's the eighth case of the disease reported in San Diego County this year. Greek student leaders at San Diego State University say that the school will investigate allegations that fraternity members mocked and intimidated women marching in a Take Back the Night rally on Friday. The SDSU Interfraternity Council says it will voluntarily suspend all social events. They'll focus on educating members about sexual assault prevention. Firefighting trainees at Chula Vista Southwestern College want to help keep Thanksgiving from turning into a disaster, so they turned out with some helpful tips. There's a reason so many people want to try what may be the most dangerous way to fix a Thanksgiving Day turkey. Firefighting instructor Steve Borland says the payoff ends up on the plate. If you've ever had one, you would, you would know the difference. And especially because it seals in everything, it makes the outside crispy, keeps it so juicy and moist. That's a good thing. Yeah. But getting the bird from the store to the fryer and then to the plate is sometimes a perilous journey. Borland says the internet is full of videos where deep frying goes spectacularly wrong. Some people think they can just take a frozen turkey or a semi-thawed turkey and then deep fry it. And that's a big problem because once the water in the, in the, in the turkey thaws, that's going to explode in the oil. Because the oil has got to be anywhere from 350 to 375 degrees. So once the water hits it, that's where you're going to get the explosion. Borland says pots can be overfilled with oil, the deep fryer can end up under an overhang, or a person could try the whole thing inside their garage. Firefighting student Michael Alejo wanted to demonstrate that it could be done safely. He set up gear in a clear area with cardboard to absorb any spilled oil. You want to fill the pot with peanut oil? He lit the burner under the pot and heated the peanut oil to 375 degrees. Then Alejo says the bird should be lowered into the pot slowly. The oil will begin to boil once your oil slowly rise up as the turkey is being lowered. Keep in note. Make sure you have heat-resistant gloves and long sleeve shirt on to protect your hands and arms. Alejo says the turkey needs to cook three and a half minutes for every pound. When it's done, Alejo says the result should be a unique and tasty holiday meal and not a holiday-related fire call. San Diego has more than a dozen death cafes, and of course it sounds a bit morbid, but it's not what you think. These aren't physical places, but rather events inspired by the European tradition of meeting in a public place to talk about important and interesting ideas. KPBS arts and culture reporter Beth Accomando speaks with Karen Van Dyke, who hosted the first death cafe in San Diego last year. When hosting a death cafe, Karen Van Dyke has an icebreaker she likes to use. When you talk about sex, you don't get pregnant. When you talk about death, you do not die. Van Dyke hosted San Diego's first death cafe in May of last year. So a death cafe is a group of people just like you, fun, intelligent, uh, wanting to discuss death and living. Don't let the name fool you. It's just an open forum. There's no belief system that's being projected onto anybody. It's a safe forum, no matter where you're at along the, the human spectrum of experience. It, it's a comfortable place to come and dialogue about things that can be uncomfortable for a lot of people and have been taboo for generations in our Western society. The death cafes actually started in Switzerland. They weren't called the death cafes then, but it was called Café Mortal. There are now 1,185 death cafes around the world. 
There are 23 countries now hosting deaf cafes. Death wants to be heard, and that's what the deaf cafes are about, letting death be heard and having that conversation with each other about that. So why don't we get started? So these are the conversation starters. We don't have to use these. There's a cup with probably a dozen conversation starters in it. Take one out and you look at it and then you read it to the people, you pass it around and each person comments on how they feel about whatever the question is. What should you say or not say to a friend who's facing death? You know, that's when I did the examination of my life. What did I want to accomplish if I only had six months to live or a year to live? A conversation starter can take you in a lot of different directions. Do you believe in life after death? You know, so uh, it's, it's how we choose to believe, you know, that uh, I just don't believe this is it. And I was raised Catholic, and so there's a lot about saints, and I love my saints. I was raised Catholic as well, and I went to Catholic school nearly my entire life <laughs> and uh, but no I, I definitely believe more in, more in the spirituality of things I also believe that we're a spirit that we're a body and um, yeah I don't think this is the end of it either what special rites or ceremonies do you want performed when you die I want my ashes spread on Navajo land okay I know I know without a doubt that that is deep in my blood somewhere. and so be it well, the cool thing is I sat next to an atheist tonight. And so, you know, and, and he's, he thinks, you know, hey, we're fertilizer when we're done here. You know, there's, that's it, you know. And, and I've been there. I was an atheist before I had an, a spiritual awakening. And so I can completely identify with that. And I love the authenticity of, of the dialogue. And here's an atheist. We're here now. Let's all do it well. And then it's done. And there's some real value in that statement. So everybody's accepted for where they're at today, right now, and they're not expected to come into a common belief. The beauty of the Death Cafe is that we are without agenda. It's that mix of people and perspectives that brings the Death Cafe to such vivid life. You know, so, but we look at it and, and everyone has a different viewpoint of that, but when we have that viewpoint, we know that death is just an end. It's, it's, it's not a period. It's a comma, because it continues and whether, to be. Whether it's a period or a comma, I, it may or may not make a difference. It makes a difference for you. Mm -hmm. I think people can, whether it's a period or a comma, can still have peace around either way. Yes. Um, and I see that in you, and the word is acceptance. Right, mm -hmm. right. Burton Disner's wife died 27 years ago. His experience with death changed his perspective on life. I had a psychologist friend many years ago said to me, until you realize you're not going to get out of here alive, seriously, he said, you're not going to enjoy life. And that's the whole idea, enjoy life while you're here. It's a short, we're only here for a short period of time relatively, and uh, uh, we've got to enjoy life every day. Beth Accomando, KPBS News. Now, in case you're wondering, December 15th, Karen Van Dyke will be co-hosting the first Death Cafe for the San Diego LGBT community. Many San Diegans are getting ready for family, friends, and a holiday feast. Others gearing up for some major shopping. Peggy Pico looks at trends coming up on Black Friday marketing. Will you spend your Thanksgiving holiday around the dinner table with family and friends, or will you cut your feast short and go shopping? It's a tough choice for some people as more large retail stores are opening on Thanksgiving Day. Joining me with the impact of holiday marketing strategies is my guest, Mira Kopik, marketing lecturer at San Diego State's College of Business Administration. And welcome back, Mira. Thank you. Thanks. Now, many be. national retail uh, chain stores like Macy's, Kmart, Target, Toys R Us and others plan to open this year again on Thanksgiving Day. Um, how has this move impacted uh, other retailers, I guess, last year and maybe the year before for the few that ventured out on this? You know, uh, it's, it's, it's good for them. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, last year, over 25 million, 45 million people visited these stores at opening mostly at around 8 o'clock. This year, they're moving their openings to 6 o'clock and 
JCPenney, 5 o'clock, Kmart, 6 in the morning. So there's going to be a lot of shoppers out there uh, on Thanksgiving Day and starting even earlier. Something else I noticed this year, though, our competitors are promoting the idea that they're actually going to be closed for the benefit of their uh, employees and their employees' families on Thanksgiving Day. Do you think that will be an effective strategy, maybe appealing to conscientious shoppers? Absolutely. And those, some of those stores like a Costco or a Nordstrom's have a very specific target audience. And those people wait to buy products and services at those locations, independent of whether a Macy's or a JCPenney is open on Thanksgiving Day. So, so it doesn't hurt them. So, it, yeah, so it doesn't hurt them. Uh, could it benefit shoppers to, to wait and, and, not, uh, and not shop on Thanksgiving Day? It certainly could. If, if you're a big shopper of one of these chains that's closed, then you have nothing to worry about. You can go Friday or Saturday or Sunday. Uh, but if you want to see what, what's out there and you're, and you're itching to buy, then, then you could start on Thanksgiving. Let's talk a little bit about the uh, Black Friday, about traditionally and historically the, the, a very profitable day. Um, how much do retailers actually profit? How big of a day is it for them on Black Friday? It's the, it's the largest shopping day of the year for retailers. Uh, so bar none, it is the single most important shopping day. Uh, close to 100 million consumers go to the malls on that day, uh, and they're looking for great discounts. They're looking to complete their, their, their whole shopping cycle in one shot. So, cyber, so Black, Monday is, or Black Friday is still the most important shopping day of the year for retailers. And, and as, is, uh, as far as uh, Thanksgiving Day, is that catching up? I think you gave the numbers. It looked like it was about half the shoppers. Just slightly below half the shoppers. And yes, Thanksgiving Day, you know, what's, what's happening is that now instead of just being a Black Friday cyber Cyber Monday uh, holiday. It's becoming a five-day holiday. It really starts on Wednesday with some pre-sales and kind of kicks into Saturday, uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And so retailers are actually changing their strategy. They're trying to make sure that they're providing a good experience, a good shopping experience for five days. How about for uh, small shop owners or small businesses? Would opening on Thanksgiving Day uh, benefit them as well? You know, it's been shown that it's, it's very difficult for a small shop owner um, because where these big retailers are located are, are in major malls. Um, however, uh, there's a Small Business Saturday that uh, is supported by American Express. And this year, almost three-quarters of consumers are going to say that it is important to shop local, and they're looking for these local retailers actually to provide some things that a traditional large retailer may not, something that's unique or special uh, that they, that, that's kind of hard to find. Well, one thing about this is, um, since you brought up Cyber Monday, a lot of people don't want to go out on Thanksgiving or Black Friday because of the crowds. They want to avoid that, and Cyber <laughs> Monday is, is steps right up to, to fill that void. What are some of the online uh, shopping trends as far as online? You know, online is the fastest, still the fastest growing segment of the shopping experience. So this year, the National Retail Federation estimates that $620 billion will be spent by consumers between just before uh, Black Friday through the end of the year. $105 million, billion is going to be spent online. That's an 11% growth rate. And, and regular shopping, the, the overall shopping, is only going to grow 4%. So traditional shopping is going to be fairly relatively flat. Online. online shopping is going to make up most of that growth. And are there other trends? Like, do people go to certain hotspots, Amazon or big retailers like uh, Macy's online, or is it just as diverse as it would be out in the city? You know, and um, on on Cyber Monday, people are looking for unique and special deals, hard to find items, but most importantly, free shipping. This year. Uh, you're not going to find free shipping very much. Uh, most retailers are requiring some kind of purchase. Uh, there's only going to be uh, one retailer that's offering free shipping all the way through the holiday season, and that's Target. And they're trying to recover from their data breach from last year, and they're being very generous to consumers. Otherwise, if you want free shipping on stuff and getting your items before the holidays, Cyber Monday is your day. All right. Mira Kobik, thanks so much for the update. Thank you. Thanks, Peggy. A new Google venture is aimed at making eating a little bit easier for people who have tremors or Parkinson's disease. The California company is throwing money behind spoons, but these aren't your ordinary utensils. Terry Che with the Associated Press takes a look at how it works. For people with severe tremors, eating a bowl of cereal can be a daunting task. Shireen Vala has a condition known as essential tremor that causes uncontrollable shaking whenever she uses her hands. It is very embarrassing, and especially in public, 
at the restaurant. But Vala can now eat with more confidence and less mess thanks to a high-tech spoon that counteracts the shaking. Makes me uh, more relaxed, less embarrassed, and less stressed. So the device itself is a stabilizer. The Liftware spoon was developed by Lift Labs, a California startup recently acquired by Google. The device detects a person's tremor and makes instant adjustments to keep the spoon or fork steady. So if I had a tremor and I move to the right, it will physically move the spoon to the left to help stabilize that motion and allow you to eat without spilling. In clinical trials, Liftware spoons reduce shaking by an average of 76%. I think it's, it's one more thing where we have to offer patients right now to help their quality of life. Lift Labs founder Anupam Patak and Google are now developing other stabilizing devices for the 10 million people worldwide who suffer from essential tremor or Parkinson's disease. At $295, a spoon isn't cheap, but Vala says it's made mealtime enjoyable again. Terry Che, Associated Press, Oakland, California. A uh, red flag warning is still in effect in San Diego County. Santa Ana winds and low humidity expected through Wednesday. It's going to be warm along the coast with some clouds. It'll cool down by Friday to the mid-70s. About the same if you're looking at the inland valleys. Temperatures there in the upper 70s. Sunny and cooler up in the mountains, warming up to the upper 60s by Friday. And expect low 80s out in the desert through the end of the week. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org. Thanks for joining us.